Thank you, Tom. I'm uh, Derek Willis with SCRA, and I just wanted to take a second and tell uh, everyone a little bit about SCRA and, and our interest in entrepreneurship here locally in Charleston. Uh, first of all, SCRA is a uh, 501c3 nonprofit uh, developed back in the, in the mid-80s, uh, 84, 85 time period, when everything in the state was, all of our economic uh, growth was being offshored in the textiles, and we were losing a lot of our intellectual property that came out of the universities uh, to our northern friends in North Carolina to research Triangle Park. So at that time in the 80s, the South Carolina solution to everything was throw land and money at the problem, and it'll fix itself. So that's exactly what happened. Uh, through a charter by the legislature in uh, 84, 85, South Carolina Research Authority was born to take care of the uh, technology-based economic development needs of South Carolina. Uh, fortunately, the, uh, the first uh, CEO of SCRA had come from the uh, aerospace and defense industry, and he recognized that uh, there were some gaps in the consistencies of manufactured parts throughout supply chains, and proposed to put together a program to fix that, commonly known today as the STEP program. We won that program, we won the uh, RAMP program, and from that time to now, we've been self-sustaining. No more money from the state. We always have people asking us, you know, what, does, what money from the state do you get? And I say, we, we get nothing but a hard time and their issues. So uh, fast forward to 2007, when my little program was uh, developed called SC Launch, we had uh, a box within our charter that said, SCRA, you're responsible for technology-based economic development in the state. We got busy and put together a program that would identify the needs uh, of our local entrepreneurs and universities. So our partners within SC Launch are research universities, uh, MUSC, uh, Clemson, and USC. We work with their tech transfer departments to pull out uh, in intellectual property and technology-based businesses. If you're gonna be in the launch program, the criteria is you have to have 51% of your employees in the state, uh, you have to be uh, chartered in the state, you gotta be paying taxes here, and you gotta have some form of intellectual property that you can protect, and then we're gonna work with you to get you through that uh, commercialization process. And to date, uh, we, uh, we have actually funded about uh, 77 million in companies. We, uh, we put to work about uh, uh, three to four million dollars a year uh, in the tune of about 13 investments a year. We'll also uh, match phase one SBIRs and, and up to about $50,000. So those are things that are important to us and important uh, to activities like what we're talking about today. Great. Thank you, Tom. All right, thank you so much. Give them a round of applause, please. <laughs> gives me a chance to bring up the slides here. All right, don't be intimidated. There are eight people up here because I am the time cop. I'm also the, the co-lead and organizer for this, uh, for this session. Welcome to this entrepreneurship and innovation session. It's particularly uh, humbling for me to be invited back. I'm not a dean, I'm a professor at Stanford University. I spend uh, a good minute of, a bit of my time getting to know you, and I know a number of you in the room. If nothing, uh, for no other reason, um, so this is the fourth year in a row I've had an opportunity to talk about this topic or organize something about this topic at an EDI. Rich and I were in Kauai uh, several years ago and then in New York and then in Phoenix and now in South Carolina. It, it is really a pleasure to be here. Anita uh, this morning laid out the case the, uh, f better than I could ever do. Just remember, just remember her comments about you know, the themes of the conference but why they mattered. Well, what we're gonna lay out and, and start a conversation about is where, how does entrepreneurship and innovation play a role in these overall themes of the conference? So we, Rich and I started working on this last fall when we uh, were so lucky to get the, the call from Tom, Kay, and, uh, and Anand to uh, organize this. And we started thinking, well, how, how do we, how do we uh, put something that's super compelling right after lunch on the Monday afternoon? So I, I uh, will be your, more or less your master of ceremonies for the, let's not call them the G8, let's call them the E8 over here. Uh, and we'll go through four pairs of, of presentations. They're going to be uh, around three topics. So the, the, the topics are A, B, and C. You'll, you'll see, here they come. 
Uh, and they're big ideas. They're, they're meant to be catalysts. They're meant to be a shot of coffee uh, about these connections between entrepreneurship and innovation with the main themes of the grand challenges as well as diver uh, uh, diversity and inclusion. Then, that's if we do this right, about halfway through the session, we're going to stop and we're going to, um, you know, e we're going to practice what we heard this morning from Freeman, which is get experiential, you know, get, get active, and we're going to do that for the last half at your tables. You can see, if you want to preview what the last half is going to be, the setup is, is these questions laying on your table right now, somewhere in the middle. They look like this, and you will have a chance to chat with your table about them, and then I'll uh, nudge, you know, some I'll look for some brave and courageous volunteers to stand up and, and give us a few highlights um, at the end. And we'll do all this by and finish uh, way before three, as promised. Make sense? All right, so let's, let's get underway with the first one, which is around commercial, commercialization and venture creation. We actually have two pairs of folks here, and I, I'm going to have them all raise their hands here. It would be fair enough. Rich and Paul, right there. For, all right, and then Phil and, oh my God, Riley, of course. <laughs> this, is a, this is a test for jet lag. <laughs> Kathy, oh my God. Melinda, that's right, and then John and Bree. All right, so there's our, there's our four pairs. It's almost like a game show. All right, so here we go. Let's get underway and get these folks into their uh, conversations. What should they know? Rich, when you come on, on up, I'll fire you up. Thank you, Tom. I'm, I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves a little bit, too. Rich Brown from the University of Utah. Um, a lot of universities now are thinking about commercialization, and the point of this session is to help you figure out whether you're doing the right things at your university or if you should be thinking of doing some things differently. I'm going to share just a few things that we do at the University of Utah and the impact that it's having on our university and on our state. First of all, a uh, few facts about commercialization that you may or may not know. Only 13% of the tech transfer offices at universities in the U.S. break even. The rest of them all lose money. Uh, a very small percentage of the disclosures ever return any royalties or income to the universities. But it's not all about the money. There is no stronger form of dissemination of research results than commercializing it. Uh, but it's a long-term proposition. It does eventually return uh, financial benefits to the university, but it's a marathon, not a sprint. As an example, the University of Utah just had a company that was sold this past year for $450 million. But that company was established in 1991. It often takes longer than people think to see the benefit back to the university. There are also benefits to the state, and I think one of the greatest benefits to the state is developing an innovative culture. And I think the universities can have a big impact on that. Uh, one other point that has really affected the way commercialization is done is that, whoops, uh, we just lost it. Yeah, no. um, thank you. Large companies do not like to license technology from universities. And to make that point, uh, the five biggest licensors, uh, Columbia, University of Washington, Arizona, Florida, and the University of Utah, in the past year had no significant license deals to any Fortune 500 company except in the medical area. And I think that's something that universities have come to understand over the past few years. So uh, there's been a change in the way that universities license. They used to protect IP at any cost and try and license it to existing companies. Then they moved to forming companies. Then uh, refining the processes, and now there's a, an effort to champion companies. At least this is the way the University of Utah has gone, and I think it probably mirrors what's happening a lot of other places, so that they try and add value and really help the company get started. The result of that at the University of Utah has been that more and more of the revenue to the universities coming from startup companies. This shows the percentage of revenue 
that came from startup companies. And you'll see in the past uh, decade, 82% of all of the income to our uh, tech transfer office has been from startup companies. So there's been a shift uh, where there are more, there's more emphasis on starting companies. You can see how we've been doing through the years. And since 2006, there have been a lot more companies started. In fact, since that time, the College of Engineering has spun out 53 startup companies. 43 of them are still in operation. Now, if you want to be successful at commercialization, you have to have a great tech transfer office. And some of the things that matter are, first of all, responsiveness. Our office gets back to the inventors after they disclose within two weeks, and in 12 weeks, they try to get back with a decision about whether they're going to patent the IP or give it back to the inventors. Uh, they have to know that their goal in life is to write a lot of licenses and to make the terms reasonable. Otherwise, they just uh, make it impossible to fund the companies. At the University of Utah, they have uh, a program called the TVC Engine. That is the way they champion these companies, and they get involved in de-risking the companies, helping them find funding. There are accelerators. I know this is the kind of thing that happens at a lot of universities. One thing that may be a little bit different is that they invest university resources that came from royalties and license income into companies. And that's one of the little edgier things that's going on and something you might talk about at your tables about whether that's appropriate or not. Um, there are a number of things that support and encourage faculty to be involved in entrepreneurism. Uh, we have a Center for Engineering Innovation that makes resources and equipment at the university available to startup companies as well as people across, company or across campus. There's a similar thing in the medical uh, campus. And recently we added Distinguished Innovation and Impact Award. This is a very high level university award that fortunately went to two engineering faculty last year. Uh, but it brings attention to uh, entrepreneurism and says we encourage you to do it. We have a group of entrepreneurial faculty scholars that help other faculty as they're thinking about starting companies. We count patents and, and contributions in commercialization toward promotion and tenure. And generally speaking, the university has a very positive attitude about commercialization. There's a number of way we ways we support students as well. Of course, courses are the most important thing, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. But we do emphasize experiential learning. Learn it by doing it. Um, there are a number of student competitions. Uh, this image was taken last Saturday from our uh, bench to bedside competition, which was held at the state capitol. You can see there are a lot of people there. Um, this is the group that won the engineering award. And uh, this competition has a prize of $15,000. The Entrepreneur Challenge, which is a statewide competition run by University of Utah students, has a $40,000 prize and an all $300,000 in uh, prizes. Uh, there are a number of other student supports. We have a Grand Challenge Scholars Program, Entrepreneur Club. We run an entrepreneur conference. Uh, there's a bio design MS degree, uh, Foundry Utah, and we have the biggest student venture fund in the country. One of the things that's underway now that's quite exciting to many of us is a new dormitory, the Lassonde Entrepreneur Dormitory. It will house 400 students and the whole first floor is maker space, 20,000 square feet with mechanical shop, 3D printers, electronics, computers, mechatronics, and so on. Uh, one of the things I would point out is, is this will be interdisciplinary space. There'll be students from virtually uh, ac across campus in it. And I think interdisciplinarity is a key to success in commercialization these days. You certainly need to get uh, the business people involved with the engineers and scientists and so on. And our U-STAR program that you may have heard of is a good example of that. Many of the senior faculty that came in have appointments in more than one uh, department, if not college. And the U-STAR building houses a lot of these people, primarily from engineering and medicine, but it brings a lot of people together. Um, 
A result of these efforts is we have more than 5,000 students every year involved in these entrepreneurial programs from 40 different departments. Our students were second in the country this year in prize money from uh, national level uh, business plan competitions. There are some things you have to worry about if you're involved in entrepreneurism. Uh, you really have to watch closely conflicts of interest and conflicts of commitment with the faculty. And in fact, you can lose some faculty. We've lost some really good ones. The ones who go out to start their companies are usually some of the best. An example of that is Steve Parker, who founded a company called Rayscale that was bought by NVIDIA. And um, he's a vice president of NVIDIA, but the guy used to run 10 uh, federally funded programs at the same time and was a fabulous faculty member. On the other side of the coin, we produce self-confident engineering graduates. Uh, the governor and the legislature love us. Uh, it's actually a big help in recruiting faculty. Last year we hired 19 faculty. 15 of them were very interested and concerned about the commercialization environment at the university. And it even helps to recruit graduate students who are interested in that. And to some extent, it also helps us keep faculty. People like Bruce Gale here, who has a wonderful company in Wasatch Microfluidics, it would be hard for any of you to hire him away from us because his company is located in Salt Lake City. Uh, all of this has resulted in helping the uh, entrepreneurial environment in Utah. There's a group that publishes a calendar called Silicon Slopes nowadays. Uh, this is just a picture of the image, or uh, part of the image of it, that lists high-tech companies in Utah. In 2000, there were 1,500 high-tech companies in Utah. Today, there's about 5,000. And Utah is third in venture capital investments per capita and seventh overall. So a lot's happened recently. Last year, there were four venture investments in Utah that made the companies worth over a billion dollars. And in the past decade, the state's, uh, the gross state product for Utah grew by 75%, despite the fact that we had the uh, economic crisis in the middle of that. So Utah has a lot of uh, accolades nowadays. I think that the commercialization environment is just part of the reason that the economy is going so well there, but it's a very important part. And uh, we not only produce the workforce, but again, we've contributed at the university to a culture of innovation. I'm happy now to introduce Paul Slusser, who's an example of the entrepreneurism that thrives in this kind of an environment. And he'll tell you about his company, Power Practical. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul Slusser, and uh, I'm the co-founder of Power Practical. I'm a University of Utah alumni. I graduated in 2009. So I'm, I'm happy to tell you today about my experience starting uh, our company. And let's just kind of go back to the beginning. Uh, in 2009, David Toledo and I were at the University of Utah. And so uh, we were studying in Dr. Ashutosh Tiwari's Nanostructured Materials Research Lab. And we were working on nanostructured thermoelectric materials. And while that's very interesting academically, we were very interested in trying the things out uh, in a real world application, what's available commercially. And so with this fascination and our love of the outdoors, David and I are both Eagle Scouts and we love the outdoor environment in Utah. And so we, we decided to go ahead and try and make one of these devices uh, functional for the outdoors. So uh, the, the goal was to make music from a campfire. We wanted, we knew the heat there could be transformed into music and we didn't know what it looked like. So we set about the process of discovering a product. And it resulted in the power pot. And the power pot's a camp cooking pot that generates electricity as you're boiling water in it. Uh, we built our first device, you know, uh, while we were students and took a cooking pot from David's mom's kitchen and drilled holes in it and riveted it all together. and. Uh, and basically came up with our first prototype. Um, and this single product, uh, we, we built a company around this single product. So uh, 
as you know, <laughs> there's a lot more to starting a company than being an engineer and having a product. And so we benefited a great deal from participating in the incubator uh, run sponsored by the University of Utah called Foundry Utah. Um, this is a kind of a complicated program and I, we don't have time to go into it. I'd be happy to answer any questions about our experience with that uh, after the session here. Um, but uh, just in terms of financing the company, we turned to the crowd, uh, operating under a very lean approach, using crowdfunding campaigns. We've actually raised almost a million dollars from the crowd for novel products. And uh, I think, you know, uh, diverse means of funding is something we've always, uh, you know, we learned from our uh, faculty advisors and from the foundry advisors. So we've also had uh, <laughs> a very interesting experience on ABC's Shark Tank, where um, we were able to raise $250,000 from Mark Cuban. And with uh, these investments and uh, all together, we've raised uh, around $1 million in venture finance. And, uh, okay. and because of all this entrepreneurial activity, uh, Shark Tank's actually holding entrepreneurial uh, auditions for the show in, uh, at the University of Utah campus on this Thursday. So I'm um, just kind of quickly overview some of the products of the company. Uh, we've expanded into related areas in power and more products are in development. And we have 10 employees and a production office in Shenzhen and we're, uh, we're in Aria and Cabela's and other outdoor retailers with our original products. And uh, new, the new products, including batteries, the Pronto Fast Charge battery, uh, will be sold in like Best Buy, Verizon, Sam's Club. Um, we're very grateful for the engineering education and advisement from the University of Utah and Dr. Tawari. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Reg. Give him a round of applause. Thank you. I hate, to, I hate to be the baseball manager that came to the mound, but we, we've got to keep rolling. We're going to stay in the commercialization and venture creation uh, realm uh, with another pairing, Phil Weilerstein, who's been my wonderful partner on the NSF project called Epicenter for the last few years, uh, but also just a great colleague over the last 20 years of advocating for uh, entrepreneurship and engineering education. So Phil, I'll let you introduce your partner. Let's welcome Phil. Thanks, Tom. Um, just while Tom is pulling this up, uh, I'm going to be talking about a couple of, of programs. I'm just curious how many of you are aware of the Epicenter program? Excellent, excellent. Um, lots of you were involved in the Campus Change Initiative. We did a session on that last year, and we're hoping to come back and talk to you about some of the opportunities that we're creating through that. But today, we're going to focus on the uh, commercialization sphere and a program called i -Corps. Um, I'm imagining that most of you have heard of this program. Anybody in the room who hasn't heard of i -Corps? Yeah, you're not going to raise your hand. <laughs> um, i -Corps is a program that is designed to create an innovation fabric across the country, building on the research enterprise that exists and that has existed for a long time, but for a long time has been relatively inefficient at translating discoveries and new ideas into impact on society in a way that will um, both build human capital and bring innovations to the fore. It's based on uh, a sort of four-level approach. Uh, the probably most critical of the four levels, which include regional nodes to provide sort of a, a strong centralized understanding, sites that recruit and engage at a more uh, local level, and then mentors and teams which actually pursue and execute emerging ideas. Uh, I believe the, the heart of this program really lies with the i -Corps teams, and we're going to hear from uh, a member of a, a team describing her experience in taking an idea and, and bringing it to practice. Uh, these are pro a, this is a program that really reaches into the lab and provides a pathway for people to move out of it. And its relevance to engineering is very high. Over 60% of the teams that participate emerge from engineering. They're funded with an NSF grant and based on a lineage of NSF funding, which for most engineering research is there. So virtually all of your researchers are eligible to participate in this program, uh, providing a rapid turnaround, nimble funding, we heard about that, which is oriented towards identifying whether or not the idea is worth taking forward into practice and into commercialization with some idea of how that might happen. 
This happens within the framework of i nodes, which are uh, regional consortia of institutions that support training programs. Our organization, VentureWell, runs the training program, drawing faculty and expertise from the nodes to offer a really rich and unique kind of experience that extends over a period of about three months to discover customers and to pursue that. But that's not all that's going on there. At the same time, the node is also working regionally both to understand and, and to do research on the process of innovation, better understanding how to make innovation happen, doing experiments with programming, and running regional programs. And, and one of the things that I'm very pleased to say is that these node programs and their regional activities are probably as large as the national program as well, and we're doing some, some work to define and better understand the impacts that are happening uh, regionally. More recently, the i program has started to do CITES grants. Anybody here have a CITES grant at their institution? A few. There are probably more of you that may not even be aware of it. There are 35 of these grants. There are 300K grants that go out to basically enrich and build the innovation ecosystem at your institution. Uh, they're, they're actually encouraging of experimental approaches and new activity, and all participation in an i site grant actually creates lineage for the teams to participate in the i teams grants. So does this work? Well, we've put about 400 teams through it. That's 1,300 people, a third of whom are students, typically graduate or, or uh, postdoctoral students. And those teams have launched 235 companies so far. Now, the ones that haven't launched, in many cases, have made a wise decision that they're not ready to take this product forward to commercialization. That's a very valuable finding. In fact, our colleagues at Georgia Tech did a study on this and were able to actually quantify the value of not going forward with these ideas and knowing that relatively quickly and in a pretty explicit way. These startups are also happening across the country. Uh, you can see that there's sort of a, a, um, a greater number in the areas that got started earlier in the program in, in uh, the New York region, in Michigan, uh, in California. But there's a lot of activity starting to happen. I think this, this map is going to green up, so to speak, over the next couple of years. And for those of you who are in the sort of uh, upper, upper left quadrant there, obviously there's not as many people, but uh, encourage your participation going forward so we can fill the gap there as well. In terms of early stage results of this, investment impact, these teams have raised $45 million in investment so far. So far, it's been pretty heavily on to the right there is SBIR funding. But the, uh, if you look at this over time, there's actually a rapid increase in private equity and private funding coming in, as well as companies that are beginning to have sales. Most importantly, I believe, and most impactfully in your role as educators, this program has a significant and, I would say, profound impact on the people who participate in it both, as you'll hear in a moment from Riley, on the trajectory of her career and the way that she thinks about her role as an engineer, but also on the people who participate as PIs and as mentors. They learn tools, they learn a mindset, and they're able to translate that to others. So one of the things that we are, I would say, most proud of about this program at VentureWell is that a vast number of the people who go through it turn around and start using these and teaching these techniques to their colleagues to their students, and that over time is going to produce some really profound impact on the efficiency of research and on economic competitiveness here in the U.S. So I'm going to turn things over now to Riley, who will tell you her, the story of her journey in i -Corp. Hi, everyone. My name is Riley Cernica, and I am a local of Charleston, South Carolina. At I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure as you guys have noticed, this is an absolutely beautiful place. So when I was getting ready to graduate college, I was going to do everything and anything in my power to make sure that I could be a biomedical engineer in this city. However, jobs are few and far between in the state of South Carolina for biomedical engineers. But good news for me, on March 15th, 2012, I got my chance to interview for one of these coveted positions. I remember going into that interview, I was fired up, I nailed it, right? Answered the questions, we were talking, laughing. 
absolutely did a great job at the interview. At the end of it, the main person I was speaking with said, Riley, you really impressed us today. You are enthusiastic and energetic. You have so many new ideas. You're so vibrant. And we're not really looking to hire people like that. <laughs> I was crushed, right? <laughs> what do you do with that? You're 21 years old, your dream of getting employed as a biomedical engineer is right in front of you, and it was squashed. I decided that I needed to go back to school with eyes wide open and rethink the career path that I was gonna go down. The interviewer brought up a point. I'm a very enthusiastic, energetic, and innovative person, and my career needed to reflect that. When I went back to school, I very quickly realized that my opportunity was already in my hands. And I mean that very literally. This is me and my senior design team, and our product was a shoulder brace concept that we were developing out during our senior year. All of my teammates and I were getting ready to go off to our new jobs, to medical school, whatever, and leave this project sitting on the shelves of our technology transfer office. And I got the idea, what if instead of pursuing jobs, pursuing paychecks, doing work that I didn't want to do, I stuck around in South Carolina and I finished what I started? great idea, but reducing that to practice was very difficult. Keep in mind, I was 21 years old, I was an engineer. I had no business experience, I had no money, our product was not finished, we had no mentors, we had no network. How in the world do you take this idea and turn it into an actual business? The answer is the NSF i program. A few months after deciding to be an entrepreneur and move this idea forward, I was brought uh, this NSF i program was brought to me and I learned about it and decided that it was worthwhile to give it a go. I was really excited about the $50,000 cash that came with this and that's really what lit my eyes up, but in actuality, the cash was really secondary to the value of the education that was brought to me by this program. The NSF i program really focuses on how you take an idea and commercialize it. It doesn't really focus so much on what that technology is. It didn't matter that I had a shoulder brace and everyone else was, had the cure for cancer or bioreactors. While this idea seemed simple, it didn't matter because there was some value in it and it was worth investigating. In order to participate in this program, we had to have a team. Dr. John Desjardins was um, served as the PI for the grant, and Dr. David Orr was an industry mentor who provided business experience. And together, the three of us went out and interviewed literally over 100 people during our time in the NSF i program. What the program really emphasizes is that you cannot determine whether your product has value by sitting in a research lab. You have to get out there and talk to people. As engineers, I think we have a tendency to want to hide behind computers, hide behind beakers and research labs and write papers, but to start a company, it's absolutely impossible to do it without getting out there. And the i program pushed me past what I thought I was capable of doing to help make this possible. As you see here, we went and interviewed people in Michigan. We interviewed people up north, out west, Canada, down south, really covered the country to figure out how we were gonna take this shoulder brace to market. And eventually we were able to figure that out. I'm proud to say that now I am the co-founder of Tarian Orthotics. We are a business that focuses on commercializing medical braces for athletes. While the shoulder brace was the first product in our line, it certainly isn't the last. Because the i program provided us with skills to determine how to validate technology and take it to market, we're able to constantly repeat that cycle with a shoulder brace, with an ankle brace, with a wrist brace, and grow an entire business around this. As you see here, our shoulder brace has come a long way. It's already out in the market making sales. My business partner and I travel to national trade shows where we're talking to top people in the industry, even have the eyes of NFL athletic trainers looking on what we're doing. It's an absolutely incredible experience that would have never happened had I not gotten rejected from that job I wanted more than anything in the world and found the NSF i program. I'm really excited about this opportunity we've been given. We have a long way to go, but i can very proud to say we have already come a long way, even at such a young age, with seemingly starting from nothing. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about the i program after. If you have any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. All right, so now you're, be I hope now you're beginning to see a pattern. Now, I didn't want to break it to you early on. Uh, Rich and I wanted to 
think of who would we like to hear from, and that was easy, Phil and Kathy and John um, of colleagues and peers, but then they brought their secret weapons. They brought their storytellers. So should we keep on going? Yeah. All right, so that was the commercialization stuff, and you can see there's been some wonderful momentum there. Now let's jump over to diversity and inclusion. I'll bring up Kathy Banks. I heard her getting teased this morning, so I think you may know her. But as, as we bring her up, she is the dean at Texas A&M, and you can see there's someone sitting right next to her. So let's let's bring it up, and turn it over to Kathy. Um, Kathy Banks, Texas A&M. As was mentioned, uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk uh, a bit about inclusivity and entrepreneurship. Uh, certainly, we've heard some some about some wonderful programs and. Um, quite a bit of the information that I'll share with you today uh, was gathered from a collaboration with um, Stanford and the i program. What I'd like to talk about today is, is truly thinking broadly about entrepreneurship, but I did want to um, back up a bit and, and highlight th this schematic that truly shows the essential skills for the 21st century workforce. When we talk about all of our students, uh, many of them need to have these skills in innovation as well as learning and life and career skills. In particular for those moving into entrepreneurship, starting their own business, life and career skills are particularly important. You know, we had a very interesting dialogue on one of our conference calls about whether every student should have some sort of training in entrepreneurship. Should it be self-selected, that is, groups choosing to do some sort of out-of-classroom experience, or should we somehow uh, integrate the idea of entrepreneurship into our core curriculum. And it was quite a lively debate. We all agree that innovation is um, something that we should uh, integrate into to core curriculum. But what about entrepreneurship, business practices, the skills needed for that? Uh, that was a question that we debated uh, quite intently. So many of us have student entrepreneurship programs. I've, you've heard from a, a number of them that have been very successful. Just, I'm just curious, how many in the room have some sort of student entrepreneurship program? Could you hold up your hand, please? So my goodness, it's probably about 85%. Uh, that's an estimate <laughs> of those in the room who, um, who have some sort of entrepreneurship program. So this idea is growing. Uh, we need to make sure that we assess whether these programs are successful. But Student Entrepreneurship Program, we heard of University of Utah is doing very well with the Faculty Entrepreneurship Program. Um, industry collaboration, we're all doing that. The whole technology transfer has been around for many years and we are uh, uh, ramping that up a bit. And the regional economic development that we just heard that's going on here in Charleston. Um, however, I wanted to say a few words about one of the programs we have. And, encourage us to think broadly about how do we engage students and um, how do we connect students with industry, but more importantly for us has been connecting students with end users. So um, oftentimes we bring industry in and you talk about the commercialization potential for a particular product, but what we've been able to do is something called let's build something in 48 hours where we've uh, engaged the end user, in other words, police officers physicians, firefighters, um, those who actually use the product. We have industry involved, but actually the students interact with those who are actually using uh, the potential uh, innovation in the real world. One recently that came about um, was a Fitbit for cows. So um, agriculture is very interested in how to assess the health of livestock, rather than driving around uh, determining what cow is standing and what cows lying down and there's a problem, um, somehow uh, having through the internet of things connectedness between the livestock and, um, and the farmer or um, uh, any type of uh, commercial entity that, that actually focuses on livestock. So when we think about entrepreneurship though, um, it's important that we also think about diversity and this came uh, to our attention uh, just by, um, through our programs and some of the concerns we have particularly about women in entrepreneurship. So you all know that there is um, significant uh, dialogue now about the number of venture capitalists on West Coast, particularly who are women, um, that it is a very, very small number. We're concerned about the number of women moving into um, venture capital and also starting small businesses. And I think uh, certainly I'm preaching to the choir here that diversity leads to be better outcomes. I believe that many of us believe that. So when we start th thinking about these programs, finding ways to incorporate everyone, again, this idea is 
uh, do we have to engage everyone in some sort of entrepreneurship training in our core curriculum uh, would be very important because many of uh, women and uh, uh, people of color may not know they're interested in starting a business. So if we don't engage them in the core curriculum, that it may be an opportunity loss. Uh, some data recently show that employees at companies with diversity are 75 percent more likely to have a marketable product implemented. And these are small companies and businesses. And the reason for that is the whole, the whole idea of super additivity of diversity. In other words, you certainly can produce a product that's perhaps marketable, but actually that product may be uh, adapted better for the population if you have a diverse workforce. And by the way, when we talk about diversity, we're talking about diversity of background, whether it's uh, country of birth, uh, socioeconomic background, as well as gender and ethnicity. Now, what came to, to light at Texas A&M that we noticed is, let me give you some data. So the founders of companies in the United States, 12% are founded by women, very small. And you all know that the engineering workforce, 15%. But at Texas A&M right now, we're about 21% women. When we look at two of our, our biggest entrepreneurship type programs, both of them are below the average in terms of the number of women. So for Aggies Invent is 15%, and that's a program that I'll talk about at the next session and cool ideas. And Startup Aggie Land, another area, and that's actually one that concerns me even more because Startup Aggie Land not only has engineers, we tend to be uh, the majority of the students involved, but also those in business and other other majors, even fewer number of women engaged in it. That may not be the case at your institutions, but it may be. Um, we, um, we feel that it's very important to, to engage women when we start developing these programs and coming forth with uh, some sort of plan of action if we see decreased numbers. So there's quite a bit of data and information in the literature about women entrepreneurs, the factors that uh, may influence participation in startup companies. And by the way, when we talk about entrepreneurial activities, we put it under the category of experiential learning. Now, um, for A&M, we often talk about th that women are more likely to go into these, enroll in these experiential learning programs. But what we've seen is a divide. So the service learning opportunities, the global opportunities, we see m more women um, often than men in those activities. What we see in the entrepreneurship programs of startup companies, fewer women. So it seems like there's a divide even within the entrepreneurial type activities. So risk is something that women um, are focused on quite a bit when they talk about uh, starting up companies. Women tend to manage risk, uh, may avoid risk. A motivation, certainly the motivation may not be the same for wom women entrepreneurs as men. Uh, and focus, women often talk, uh, focus on startup and stabilization, but not plans for uh, expansion. And this isn't every woman who happens to be an entrepreneur, but these are characteristics that have been noted about uh, women entrepreneurs in general. So in terms of uh, A&M, what we're thinking about, two challenges for us is one, how do we recruit more women students into entrepreneurship programs? And that leads us to the debate, should entrepreneurship be part of our core curriculum so we reach everyone who may be interested? And second, how, as we get them into these programs, how do we better prepare women students and actually everyone, but with a uh, program that actually that thinks about uh, some of the challenges associated with, uh, with being a woman in um, startup land. So what I'd like to do now is pass it over to Melinda McClure. Melinda McClure is a senior at Texas A&M. She's been engaged in many of the entrepreneurial programs that we have, and she's the president of the Student Engineering Council, means she's, which means she speaks for about 15,000 students. So Melinda. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so I am a senior chemical engineer at Texas A&M, which means I'm probably the only one in the room without a degree. So what I'm going to do is talk about myself, because I feel like I'm an expert in that. Uh, so first of all, I have been involved in basically every entrepreneurship activity that Texas A&M has offered. And so I've learned a few things from those. One, there's not very many women, just as Dr. Banks showed. Two, the women in diverse groups lead to better outcomes, like she mentioned. And three, um, a lot of times the women are afraid to speak up. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is my experience in Aggies Invent, which is one of the programs that Dr. Banks mentioned. So we were working with Sandia National Labs to create a GPS identification and tracking device for survivors of large-scale natural disasters, 
essentially what it would do um, is if it was activated, it would let Red Cross or other groups know that this is where the survivors are and we need to get the resources there. So myself and many of, I was in a group of nine people, about nine, um, and so there were seven men and two females. And so myself and the rest of the guys were really focused on figuring out this GPS, figuring out the satellite, and the other girl in my group, Melissa, came up to me and whispered in my ear and she said, hey Melinda, I have this new idea, but I don't wanna share it. And so she talked about how we should not only use these capsules to identify the, the uh, the survivors, but also to provide them with some sort of graphics on how to survive until the, uh, the items or the resources came their way. And so she was afraid to share that to the whole group, and so I shared it for her. Well, when we won the program, it was one of the best things that the judges said, one of the best parts about our project. And so she was afraid to speak up, but her unique perspective on this project and really keeping the mission in mind allowed for a greater outcome for our team as a whole. And so I've personally felt some of these motivations or risk problems um, as I've pursued leadership at Texas A&M University. Like Dr. Banks mentioned, I currently serve as president of Student Engineers Council, which I guess is arguably one of the highest student leadership roles in the college. And so I had a huge trouble running for the position. It's scary to put yourself out there. It's scary, especially as a woman, um, to assume that risk. And I m almost backed out multiple times solely based on the fact that I was running against two males. And so luckily, I have a great role model in my life who is my mother. And she has been an entrepreneur. She has been able to uh, show me that it's OK to take risks, really encourage me to take risks, um, let me specify that she means uh, educational entrepreneurial risks, wasn't a huge fan of the skydiving idea. Um, but her example in my life has really helped me reach my potential and once I took those first risks, now I've been able to really influence some of the changes in our student programs at Texas A&M University and feel a lot more confident going into that in the future. And so really the reason I share this is because if we want more women entrepreneurs in the workforce and in the future, we need to start engaging them early and while they're in college. And so I have been a huge, ben I have benefited greatly from the programs at Texas A&M, but I also have a few unique situations. So the questions that Dr. Banks po proposed and uh, are really important to figure out how to get the women engaged early so that those numbers for women who are starting their own businesses, running their own companies, um, change in the future. So. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, one more pairing, and then we'll uh, cut you loose for uh, some discussions at your table regarding these topics. We're going to finish with a couple of local people. Not as local as Charleston, but to Clemson University. John and Bruce. Very good. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're here to talk today a little bit on uh, faculty and student engagement, uh, bottom-up approach, a top-down approach. And uh, we're going to start off today, I think the food might be getting to you, so we're going to uh, get a little wild here, and we're going to do some uh, family feud style stuff. Okay? So we're going to get a little, little action going. There we go. I'm going to need five volunteers from the audience, and uh, th this will be uh, the Dean family. We're going to call it the Dean family, and if I don't see hands soon, we're going to just cold, cold. cold call them. Okay. Oh, family over here. I think this table looks like a great family, so we're going we're gonna to volunteer this entire family here. So come on up. Stand on up. You are on the family feud. You look like a great There you go. Come on. Come on stand up here. Come on up here. We're going we're gonna to do the family feud. So... Um, we, uh, I think you all know how this works. Uh, we actually did a survey of 100 people, and uh, we, these are actual results. So we, uh, the, uh, on the board here, we have name something that your dean can do to assist in developing a successful INE initiative on your campus. So what can you do to help? Family dean, I'm going to give you a couple of seconds to think about that topic. We have top eight answers on the board. Name something that your dean can do to assist in developing a successful INE initiative on your campus. 
First answer? Provide funding. Funding. It's funding. Survey says. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, you guys are on a roll. I love it. Very well done. Okay. You know how this works. We go down the row. You get them all, you win. Don't get a buzzer. All right. Dean family number two. And Jill. Support. Support. Hmm. Support. Mm. Mm. Support. Good answer. Good answer. Good answer. All right. Oh, we got a little buzzer there. Support. Maybe, maybe just a little too general there. All right, Royce. One, one, one buzzer down. Let's see what he got. Start a student competition. Competition. Okay. All right. Some kind of a. Incentive or, uh, okay, provide some. Oh, we have incentives and recognition. Oh, very good. Well done, well done, well done. Jason. Company partnership? Partnerships. Partnerships, like internships, hmm. partnerships, something for students to do. You okay? Yeah. All right, survey says. Oh, mentors and connections. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> this is all on the fly. <laughs> All right, Bo Joseph, what do you got? What do you got for me? I think we need space and equipment. Maybe a new maker space. Ma space and equipment. Good answer. Good answer. All right, space and resources. I think you guys were paying attention earlier. Here we go. All right, we're back up to the front. Gene? Ensure diversity in thinking and thinking and the teams. All right, this survey says, oh. Uh, who, who took this survey? I don't know. <laughs> so clearly, I think there's some work to be done there. You know, these this top 100, 100 people survey said. What do we got? Come on, you got to help her out here. <laughs> come on, come on. Top second answers on the board. These are students and faculty who are surveyed. These are your people here. Take suggestions from the audience. IP policy. IP policy. Yeah. IP policy. Oh. You got oh. one more. One more chance. Yeah, yeah, I'll give you one, one more. Minute. All right, last, last. From the audience, anyone, help them out. Lifeline. Partner with your business school. Partner with your business school. Survey says. Oh, okay, we're going to throw that one up there. <laughs> All right. Well done, well done, well done. Yeah. Last call from the Dean family. Any last suggestions here? We're still missing three. Actual survey results here, ladies and gentlemen. Mentors, we got the mentors and connection up there. Yep, yep. Curriculum, do I hear curriculum? Courses and training, well done, well done. Oh, I gotta have the third buzzer, so come on. <laughs> okay. All right, Joe, what All right number five, survey. <laughs> Influence and power. What can your dean do for you? Come on, people, let's get pumped. <laughs> All right, number eight, <laughs> vision and a champion. All right, thank you very much, dean family. Thank you, thank you. All right, so we were putting this together, and we thought we'd figure out what, what, the, de what the students and the faculty actually think the deans can do for them when they're trying to develop things. So a bottom-up approach. So what we'd like to talk to you a little bit about today is this bottom-up approach. So what can you bring to projects? Uh, they they kind of filter down through, through vision, power, money. People want your money. They do. And you have the power to give it, and you have a vision to guide that. And most of the answers that we saw were definitely down in the give me stuff <laughs> section of things. <laughs> Uh, with regards to the students and, and the faculty. So they, they don't care very much about your vision. Uh, they want your power and your money and your influence. So how do, that's the bottom-up approach, essentially. How do you get there, though? How, how do you get uh, your vision aligned with, their, with your money and power and you involve students and faculty as well? So we're going to give you a, little, a few examples of how that, that is currently happening at Clemson and how we're involved. Yeah, and so I'm Bree Prozelski. I'm a PhD student at Clemson University. Um, also, it's called a University Innovation Fellow, which I'm going to get to in just a moment. But all of the answers that we saw on the board earlier were, like Dr. Desjardins mentioned, wants and needs from these students and faculty. 
Um, but some of them are kind of vague. And I'd really like to be able to share with you guys some stories from the innovation trenches of, you know, what can you as deans do tomorrow or when you get back to your campuses? Uh, actual physical examples. And so the first of which is that University Innovation Fellows Program, which is a joint venture between uh, VentureWell, which is Phil Willerstein's representing today as well, um, and Epicenter at Stanford University, which is from where Tom Byers is from. And the University Innovation Fellows Program they seek to empower students across universities, doesn't matter what your major is, to be change agents on your campus with respect to innovation and entrepreneurship. Now, we're engineers in the, in the room. We like to see data. So we decided to throw up a graphic up there in the top left corner, a uh, pie chart there to kind of show you the distribution of faculty and student um, efforts within each of these initiatives uh, that we're gonna talk about. So. The students are going to be the purple, the orange is going to be the faculty moving forward. But it's not just students and faculty that are doing this work. We have a dean, and you guys are all deans here in the room, and our dean has been very supportive of a lot of these efforts. And specific examples of these are being a public relations machine, an advocate, administrative supporter, and that money and that funding that we talked about uh, before. So another program that we have at the faculty level is certainly the Pathways to Innovation program. Very similar, uh, it's trying to activate faculty and, and hire administrators on campuses to, to engage in, in innovation and entrepreneurship, but more importantly, to get mentorship in those practices. So this is a, a network across uh, the United States in which if you're a part, you uh, basically are paired with other universities that are struggling to solve problems related to how to get innovation and entrepreneurship practices on campus. And these are best practices. So it's a peer group mentality. You get together once a week and I'm a part of this, and you get together and figure out what's working, what's not working, who's causing problems, and how to get those problems out of the way. So it's a, it's a very engaging program, and it seeks to determine how to get change in innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystems on your campus. And uh, with regards to the dean, you have to go all the way to the top to get this one, so you have to engage the president, but you also have to have that PR machine active, it has to have an advocate on your campus, and they have to have administrative support to get that done. So 10% release time for me, somebody had to say okay. So that was kind of important. So moving forward, what I saw as a university innovation fellow, I saw a gap on our campus and that students weren't communicating with students outside of their major. So we just, we invented something called the DEN, stands for the Design and Entrepreneurship Network in Clemson. And students from any major can come together with their, their ideas, their passion. We connect them with faculty and then mentors from the outside community to develop themselves and their ideas. And we've gone also back to our dean and he has been an extremely positive PR machine, advocate, and alumni recruitment for this network that we're developing at Clemson. Great, and another thing that you need is the courses. So number two on the uh, survey says was the courses. So without uh, engaging your student body and beginning to educate them on what's available on your campus, not much is gonna change. So one of the first things that, that we went set to work on was getting freshman courses that begin to teach students what's available on campus and giving them the opportunity to see that engaging in design and entrepreneurial thinking is okay on your campus. So over the course of the last year, we've instituted four, uh, the framework for four new courses, which will be offered to our freshmen coming in, and that's begun to network them into this innovation and entrepreneurship culture on our campus. So how do you get that done? That's, that's, a, that's a high up one. Uh, so you gotta have that, that vision uh, that you provide, some influence, some, uh, some meeting of the minds at the deans and, and the general engineering department, and then the administrative support to make that happen. We also have some started something at Clemson called the, the Innovation and Entre Entrepreneurship Living Learning Community, similar to the Lausanne Institute there at University of Utah. It's a 24-7 melting pot of ideas for students from any major to come together, live together, and generate those ideas and start those companies. But we couldn't do that alone. We again had that meeting of the minds, brought together the engineering school with the business school, and had a brainstorming dinner to really jumpstart that effort. And that's what our dean did to contribute to that effort as well. So yeah, paying for dinner. Yes, paying for dinner. it was delicious. Yeah, it was Thank good, you. it was very good. Uh, th none of this happens unless you can get some buy-in from your other departments. Uh, and so one of the things that happened was I was voluntold to chair uh, the Entrepreneurship and Innovation College Task Force Committee. 
And that is basically getting together representatives from all of the, all of the different uh, departments in our college and letting them know what's going on and letting them know that this pipeline of students who's, who have been sparked with innovation and entrepreneurship is coming their way. So what do you do with a sophomore or junior or a senior who is coming into your department having been told that they can do all of this but yet sees a curriculum that is not aligned with that and is just thrown into a, a standard uh, curriculum through design but there's no entrepreneurship in it. So uh, beginning to meet all of these people and telling them that uh, their, their departments have an opportunity to engage in this innovation and entrepreneurship <coughs> culture and uh, that required uh, some, some arm twisting and uh, some administrative support and some directive uh, down through the chairs of the departments to get this task force established. It was mentioned earlier that we really want to expose these students earlier to these, uh, these concepts of innovation and entrepreneurship. So we started something called the Lemonade Stand, Accelerating Design and Entrepreneurship, and we brought together a group of high school students to solve real world problems in the areas of culinary, arts, <laughs> health, IT, and uh, education. And it was a fantastic weekend, but we couldn't do it alone. We had a great advocate in the dean's office. Um, but really pushing that forward, empowering these students and creating that, that awareness that developing these skills is important at any age. We did that also with a national program with Three Day Startup, uh, which was a lot of sleep deprivation, a lot of caffeination, but really a, a lesson in developing businesses uh, at the college level. And again, that was a, an effort that was not just done by students and faculty. You in the room can do that as well. So, uh, moving forward, if we combine all the data that was up in that left-hand corner, uh, I have a question of which is not like the others up here. And it technically is a trick question because uh, all, all of these pie charts involve faculty and students. Uh, what we found is that you can't just have a top-down or a bottom-up approach. You really have to have both to make this work at your university. So with regards to that, the idea of a bottom-up to top-down, we're going to have you discuss that in one of the sessions after this. The, uh, the idea being that, yes, certainly students and faculty are, are needed for this, but you know, if you call faculty the top, that's certainly not the case. They, they need uh, to have the dean's input at all levels. And above all of these, above all these things that you contribute to and you provide success to, uh, you have to make sure that, that at the dean's level, things are happening too, the vision, partnership campaigns, faculty can't build buildings, so you guys build buildings, go ahead, that'd be a great idea. Uh, and new hires, so uh, whether you do a top-down or a bottom-up approach, uh, having inclusion, student, faculty, and deans, uh, and the, the little red up there is for the president, that's good, uh, ne needs to happen. So uh, how, do you, how do you get that sweet spot, uh, dean, students, faculty, uh, and get to where you need to go? All right. John? And you need your champions. All right, John Bree, can you give him a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. And